Hi, Judge Frank Caprio here. Welcome to my home in Providence. Well, this is our third segment of Court at Home in Providence. Thank you so much for your support. We've received thousands of questions, and we're trying to take as many as we can. But I really appreciate your support. It makes us stronger to go on. Now, take care of yourself in the meantime. But without making a long speech, let's get right down to the questions, okay? And the first question is from John Wilson from Madison, Wisconsin. And John wants to know, how can you be so compassionate toward offenders who appear before you? Is it by your training as a judge because you're a Christian? Or how you were raised by your parents? Well, I think in life, a lot of what we do is because of our background. Most of us, you know, are the some product of our experiences in life and maybe a family and our upbringing. My upbringing came from a working class family. My father was one of 10 and my mother was one of nine. So that's 19 people in both families and most of them married. So between my parents and my aunts and uncles and their spouses probably had 40 relatives. Of the 40 relatives, they were all working class people, most of them came from Italy, not one, not one went to the eighth grade. So these were the people that I was exposed to during all those formative early years of my life. And everyone, I mean, I never went hungry. I had 20 aunts and uncles I could go to and every door was open, you know, <laughs> my gram and, and my two grandmothers. And everyone helped everyone else and I understood from an early age what it was to be raised up in a working class family and not have an abundance of material things. But we had an abundance of love and understanding. We were taught to take care of each other and to help each other, particularly in times of need. I want to show you a photo of my brother and myself. Now, this is my brother. And you can see he has milk bottles in his hand. And that's me. I was 10 years old at the time. And my dad woke us up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work on the milk truck. And when we were on the truck, he would say to us, you know, I won't be able to afford to send you to college. So if you don't want to do this the rest of your life, you better find a way to get to college. And it was... Those experiences and that close family tie and that getting up at four in the morning gave me an understanding of what it is for people who come before me. Many of them have those same experiences. You know, $20 to them may mean not eating that night or maybe depriving their children of something or some necessity of life. So I take all of those factors into consideration. So when I look at them, I... I think I look, I see in many ways, I see my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. I see myself as a youngster uh, in our circumstances. So in the words of my dad, never forget where you came from. And I try not to forget where I came from and place myself in the same position of the people before me. And those are the experiences that help me make a judgment. Thanks for the question. Our next question is from Cole Nell from Florida. And Cole Nell says, I don't have a question. I just wanted to share that I made your meatball recipe and it was a hit. My husband finally said I did a good job. Right on. Thank you, Judge. Okay, now, we uh, had a segment where I made my, my mother's recipe for meatballs. And we disseminated that on, on television. So ne that's what uh, Cole was talking about. And so she used that recipe. Now, Cole, I must confess to you that that's my mother's recipe. But you can deviate with the, with the ingredients. For example, I said, make sure you use hot Italian bread, you know, and soak it in water or in milk. You can use breadcrumbs as well. And I said, use two eggs. You can use one or three, depending on your taste. And the same with the cheese, you know, and the... Uh, so all of those ingredients are important according to your taste. But the most important thing now is don't make the meatballs round. Make them 
oval like this. That's Philly's recipe. That's my mother's name. My mother's name was Philomena, but my father called her Phil, Philly, and so those are Philly's recipes. Make them nice and oval like that, and that way they'll cook through. Because Cole, I remember as a youngster, you know, it was always 10 o'clock mass, and then rush home, because I know mom would be making the meatballs. And my brother and I, we take them out of the frying pan while they were, they were still fried. They were nice and sizzling and hot. So if my mother was going to make, let's say, 10 meatballs, she had to make 20, because my brother and I would be eating them so fast as she made them. So then she had to have enough when we had dinner uh, on that day. So I'm so pleased that, and I, I ask all of you, if you, uh, if you want to make meatballs, maybe you can check that segment. It's online. And uh, we're going to be doing more on uh, coal. So, Cole, stay tuned. I just might, I just might give you my recipe for roasted peppers. That would be unbelievable. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Okay. Our next question is from Julie Mayer Potts from Atlanta, Georgia. And Julie says, how do you feel about the political climate today? We crave direction in our leaders, and it seems that both sides are creating fear and controversy. Do you get discouraged, and what can we do to stay sane during this mis mudslinging time? Julie, I think most people share your frustration, but, but understand that we have been through many crises in government in this country. I mean, we actually went through a civil war. Can't think of anything worse than that. And we were able to survive, not only survive, but to come back stronger than, uh, than ever. You know, many people think that their side is right. So if you support one side, you think your side is right. Other people think their side is right. But at the end of the day, I think both sides, no matter who you support, I think in their heart, they think they're doing the right thing. I don't think any of our leaders are up there saying, I'm going to punish this one, or I'm doing something wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I think they're all well-intentioned. But the answer to that question is that we choose our government. And people govern with the consent of the governed. Now, what does that mean? That, that people in government govern with the consent of the governed. It means that we choose our elected officials, that we choose them. And they can't, they're not there unless we give them our consent. How do we give them our consent? We go to the ballot box. We vote. That's the key. There's always a key. So, you know, I know many people who are very blasé about voting. They say, oh, my vote doesn't count. What difference does it make? You know, it's all going to be the same. That's not true. In the history of our country, uh, We've always had situations, you know, where the public has, through an uprising of support and their attention, have been able to change the course of history. And so that's what we have, that's what we have to do. So I implore you, make sure you vote. Get your relatives and friends out, regardless what party you belong to. Go to the polls and vote. That's the key. Okay, now our next question is from Laura Hyssop from New Hampshire. And Laura wants to know, is the courtroom open to the public for people like me? <laughs> they just want to sit and watch. Well, Paul, I don't know what kind of, uh, Laura, I don't know what kind of person you are. You said people like me. <laughs> Actually, I think you're probably a very pleasant person. And you are welcome to come to our court. We've had people from all over the world visit our, our, our courtroom. They fly into Providence, and we're promoting commerce in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I, I had a young man uh, come in with his family, come in from uh, South Korea. Uh, somebody came in from uh, Thailand, uh, all over the world. Recently, someone was in the courtroom from Los Angeles, New York. We had several people from New York. And most of them come. Now, Laura, if, if you decide to come, Laura, make sure we know you're coming 
and make sure when you when you come that I know you're there. Because Laura, just maybe, you know, just maybe, I might have you come up on the bench and help me decide a case or two. And then well, maybe you could give me some direction on how to handle these cases. I get all these questions asking me, you know, what, what my temperament is and uh, uh, by what, uh, how am I being guided and what factors do I take into consideration? So you might be able to teach me a thing or two. I welcome that. Well, the answer to, that qu the answer to your question is you are welcome to come into the courtroom. We are an actual court proceeding. You know, we are not a, a uh, studio court proceeding. Most programs you see on TV of court proceedings are in a studio. You know, and you notice everyone's all seated properly, everyone's dressed properly, you know. That's, that's all prearranged. The decisions, the cases are all prearranged, and the decisions are all prearranged. And they do a great job. As a matter of fact, I admire them. Uh, I think they do, you know, they do a great service. Uh, but we're different. We are an actual proceeding. And when I find somebody, they pay it. You know, <laughs> there's, no <laughs> there's no company paying for it. They pay or they don't pay. So, put it very succinctly, uh, we're the real deal, you know. It's, it's not show time, it's real time. Okay. So, Laura, the answer to your question is, people like you are welcome in my court. Come and see us. Okay, and we have a question from Peter Caspi. And Peter wants to know, have you ever been under scrutiny by your peers for being too lenient? Now, the answer to that, I can answer that question in, in one word and say no, but that's, not, that's really not the answer. Uh, the province court, municipal court, is probably the court that, court that is closest to the people. You know, most people who come to my court really don't have to go to court because they've, they've sent the summons saying that they owe Two hundred dollars, or three, whatever the amount might be, they sent the summons, so they can pay it and not come to court, or they have a speeding ticket, they can pay it and not come to court. Most of them are in that situation, so remember that for someone to actually come to court and take time out of their work, take time out of their daily activities, their families, and spend a few hours, you know, maybe I just should listen to them very carefully. So, you know, the day that I forget that $20 for someone could change their week, you know, then, then shame on me. I, I don't want to be live with that burden. So, we have really raised the awareness uh, of how the municipal court works, like, worldwide. Because we've actually, you know, we have had Four billion people view the proceedings of court and province. Four billion, which is almost half the world's population, have, have viewed us. And so my peers uh, many times stop and tell me that they think that I am doing a, a service to the state of Rhode Island uh, because we are, we are portraying the court in a very favorable light, not only to the country, but to the world. And it's interesting because I receive letters from all over the world. I mean, I, I get them from India, from China, from Japan, <laughs> from Thailand, from all of the European countries, and from people in this country, you know, saying, and what they basically do, without going through a long dissertation, they lend support to the manner in which we conduct our court proceedings. Because we try to treat everyone with a degree of respect and decency and understanding and dignity, regardless what their station in life is. I don't care if you're a multi-billionaire or if, you're, if you have no money in your pocket, you're going to be treated the same in my courtroom. You know? And if I don't, then shame on me. And if you ever think I don't, call me out on it. Call me out on it. You know, uh, it's very important me to take people's circumstances into consideration. And I'll get to that later on in another question. Okay, so Peter, thank you for that question. It's a good question. Next question is from 
Sharon Langley Pox. And Sharon asks, Judge, I love watching your, pro your court proceeding. My question is, is there a ruling that you made that you regret 100%? And Laura, I beg your pardon, Sharon, I am saddened to say that there is, and it still bothers me. When I first went on the bench in 1985, my first week on the bench, you know, I don't remember how I felt, but I hope I wasn't full of myself because that's not really not me. But my dad, God love him, my dad came down to view the court proceedings. And the day that he came down was the first week I was on the bench. This woman came in and she just had a terrible attitude. And I don't remember the particulars. I just remember she had a terrible attitude. And I remember that I fined her the full fine. I think it was $300. And after the court session was over, I went in chambers and I told my security guard, to please get my dad and have him come back. I want to talk to him. And I said, Dad, how did I do? My father looked at me and he shook his head. He says, Frank, he said, that poor woman, he says, uh, how could you find her the full amount? He says, you don't, you don't know anything about her. I said, I said, Dad, she had a terrible attitude. He said, Frank, you don't know why she had a terrible attitude. You don't know like, how many kids she has. You don't know what her, circ what her circumstances are. You didn't know anything about her. He said, you can't do that. He said, how do you know now when she goes home tonight? You know, maybe she can't put food on the table for her kids. Maybe she can't pay her electric bill. And they may turn the electricity off. She, maybe she can't put gas in her car. Maybe she can't take her children to school. You don't know anything about her. He said, you can't do that. To this day, to this day, it's, it still bothers me. It bothers me on two fronts. Number one, that my father was right. And I often say I hope that I didn't cause a major problem for that woman and her family. And if I could ever find her, I would love to make it up. I'll give her five times the amount I, that I charged her. Really, it just bothers me. And the second thing that bothered me is I disappointed my dad. Not too many times. That, that meant a lot to me. So the answer to your question, uh, uh, Sharon, is unfortunately I regret 100% that decision. I wish I could do it again. But we don't do makeovers here. You know, This is not a, a studio court proceeding. This is the real deal. And once I make my decision, that's it. And... I actually many times look up now and try to get some divine inspiration. And that's why now you may notice that people come in for a ticket and all of a sudden I'm asking them, hi, how are you doing? Do you have any children? How old are they? You know, do you have anything you want to tell me? Are there any special circumstances you think I should know? So that I can look at the total picture and then make a decision that I think is just, is just. You still got me thinking now, Sharon. You got me thinking back to that decision I made in 1985. Oh, God. Anyway, it's a good question. Now, John Gebhardt Jr. from New Jersey wants to know that I wrestle in college. <laughs> and so what was my record? Well, you want to know my record in college, eh? <laughs> John, I did not wrestle in college. Uh, I did wrestle in high school, however, and uh, back then, this was 1954 when I wrestled, uh, they really weren't offering college scholarships for wrestlers, uh, at least not around here. And so I ended up going to a Providence College back then and actually washed dishes 
in a restaurant in downtown Providence and then actually helped work on a milk truck and did, did situations such as that to, uh, to go on to college. Because as my father told me, if you don't want to work on the milk truck at 4 o'clock every morning, make sure you go to college. But I did wrestle in high school. And I have some very fond memory, memories of that. My, my wrestling team, Central, I went to Central High School in, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. And it, was, it was, wasn't a private school. It was a, it, actually a working class school. Most of, the, most of our parents, everyone that I knew, all our parents were working class. I don't remember too many uh, youngsters in my class or in the school having people who were professionals at that time. But we had a great team. And we actually won the state championship that year. And John, I'm going to show you a couple of things. These are two medals. And this medal was for winning the state championship. And this medal was for being the outstanding wrestler in the tournament. Now you can see they're still like brand new, and these vessels. Let me see, 1954. That's uh, wow, 46 and 20. These are 66 years ago. The medals are 66 years old, and I still treasure them. I still treasure them, and I keep them. They bring back many happy memories. And you know, uh, you want to know what my record was, and I actually in the finals of the state championship, I had to wrestle the New England champion, and. And he was a uh, he was an excellent wrestler. He was a, he had been a state champion the year before, a New England champion. And uh, anyway, I met met him in the final uh, in the finals of the state championship. I remember the day so well. We actually wrestled at the Brown University's gym. It was a place called Marvel Gym. And my dad was in the stands with his milkman uniform on. His oldest brother, my father was one of ten, his oldest brother, Luigi, was there. Luigi just spoke broken English, you know, and I could see him up in the stands and say, make sure you do good, you're going to do good now, you're going to do good, you're going to do, you're going to win, now you're going to win. My father's there in the milkman uniform and places jammed. I can still remember every single second of that match. I can still hear my father's voice saying, come on, Frankie, come on, Frankie. And it was just a wonderful experience. I go, I'm not taking anything away from, the, uh, from my opponent. He was, a, he was a great wrestler. And maybe I got lucky, but somehow I ended up winning that match. And, and I actually pinned him. And that's how I became the outstanding wrestler of the tournament and won all state honors. But I, I still think of that day, uh, what it meant. Uh, to me, I know as soon as the match was over, the first thing I did is I just ran to my dad. And my mother, you know, never attended a wrestling match because she was afraid I'd get hurt. Because she wasn't, <laughs> I couldn't explain to her that, you know, re wrestling in college and high school isn't like she saw her on television. She thought it was like people throwing people, you know, and banging them down and so forth. So she thought I'd get hurt so she wouldn't come. And it, we didn't have cell phones in those days, so... My father drove me home, and my mother, as soon as we came up, my mother says, how'd you do, Frankie? How did you do? And I told her I won, and she had this big smile on her face, and she says, I know you're going to win. I had the biggest meal that night. It was, it was better than our Sunday meal. She baked me a chocolate cream pie. She made my favorite, uh, we call it pasta now. She called it macaroni. She made my favorite macaroni. We had meat, but we had all of the Italian delicacies that night to celebrate my victory. So it just was a wonderful experience. My uncle Luigi was telling everybody in the air, arena that would listen to him that he was my uncle. And so I did not, that's a long answer to your question, that I did not wrestle in college. But wrestling taught me some great lessons in life. It taught me that perseverance, it taught me discipline, right? Uh, and it taught me respect. Because anyone that's involved in sports will tell you that you always respect your opponent. 
And so I, I think our coaches that, uh, my, my old co my coach's name was Carl Loro, a wonderful gentleman, and my teammates, and uh, many of them, we still get together. We had a meeting last year, as a matter of fact. So the bond of people in athletics is, is strong. And so I want to thank all of you for everything that you do. And many of you now are continuing to send money into the Philomena Fund. Now, you know, the Philomena Fund is the fund. I named it the Philomena Fund because people send in uh, donations to the court for me to use my discretion to help people. Well, the court is closed now because of the coronavirus. And so many of you have been so generous that we have a generous surplus in the Philomena Fund right now. So I would ask all of you that until this coronavirus uh, goes away and we find a vaccine that can cure it and that the court opens, that you make your generous donations to someone or some organization in your area, you know, maybe to some of our health care providers, maybe to some orphans, maybe to a food bank, but to someone in need, uh, maybe a poor family, maybe some children that are hungry, uh, but your generosity is overwhelming, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate the donations you have sent in to help those who are unfortunate who appear before my court. And so until next time, stay safe, stay at home, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for your support.